Welcome. We're very happy to have with us Pamela Marone. She, through her company, Marone Bio Innovations, is one of the, the most, uh, that's the word, innovative suppliers of uh, biology-based fixes for agriculture, both in pest control and in fertility and, and uh, crop health uh, improvement. In an ideal world, a plant is so healthy it has its own internal defense system. But weather extremes happen, stressors happen, invasive bugs come through, and so growers need the, the tools to, um, to combat the problem, solve the problem in a, in a clean, less toxic way. So she's going to talk to you about both using biology-based solutions to improve crop health, improve resiliency, but also fight pest problems. Please welcome Pamela Marone. Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon. Yes, I stand here with trepidation with this audience because inputs are not always considered a good thing and you want to, to farm in a way without inputs. And I heard some fabulous talks uh, yesterday and today showing some model systems where you could minimize your inputs. But as, as you know, sometimes um, there, is, there is a need for inputs. So I'm gonna give you the foundational information about biologicals. We're a public company traded on NASDAQ, so the lawyers make me <laughs> say this, uh, uh, this forward-looking statement. Well, all this says is, is there's anything that I say today that's about the future and that doesn't come true, please don't trade stock, um, our stock, based on that. <laughs> so I, I'm in a world where I'm just a couple hours away from Silicon Valley in California. And Silicon Valley has discovered ag tech and, ag, and food tech. And there's an amazing number of startups that are in uh, ag tech now, ag biologicals, and the whole farm to fork area. About $4 billion has been invested thus far this year into startups. A lot of, because I've started three companies in, in uh, biologicals, a lot of new, new entrepreneurs come to me for advice. So I get a, to take a look at a lot of different things that's going on. And it is the most exciting time to be in agriculture. So if you know young people who are thinking uh, and they don't want to be a farmer or go back to the farm and where are they going to get jobs, um, it used to be academia, you know, be a professor or be a research technician if you didn't have a PhD, or uh, you go to, to USDA or uh, maybe a chemical industry. Now there's so many other alternatives for young people to work at a startup or even do a startup. I had a PhD graduate student from Michigan State call me at the recommendation of her professor and say, you know, I discovered this pretty cool way to uh, diagnose uh, plant diseases and I'm wondering if I could, could start up a company around that technology. And then I talked more to her and I said, yeah, I think you have an entrepreneurial personality. Go for it. And I, that's, that's my recommendation these days. Just an amazing number of startups. I don't even have a third of what, uh, the number of startups that are in, in this space. And there's so many problems still to solve, whether it's food waste or improved crop varieties or, um, you know, uh, or ways to weed or, or any, anything like that. And there's a quite, believe it or not, $600 million has been invested in farming insects for human food and for animal food. Amazing. But in my world, I live in California, so California is a very litigious, highly regulated state, and there's always something going on and some lawsuit or uh, some, somebody suing uh, about pesticides or the Department of Pesticide Regulation restricting chemicals. Most recently, they uh, put out a restriction on chlorpyrifos. And, uh, and Europe uh, is another hotbed. Yesterday, European Union voted to restrict copper, even in organic farming, because it's an environmental pollutant. And also what popped up on my screen yesterday was, you know, how many of you probably don't know that you're using uh, a compound called fipronil in frontline on your pets. And that's a once a month for fleas and ticks. And about two years ago, I told my vet, she says, well, what do you want to use for your, you know, for your pets? I said, well, I'm not going to be using Frontline. And she looked at me and I said, well, that compound is heavily fluorinated and it's going to show up in the groundwater, if not be killing bees before too long. Sure enough, there was a news article yesterday that said scientific evidence now showing um, one of the key players in, in bee decline. So uh, there's always something. So that makes this world, my world, very exciting because I spent my career looking for alternatives. It takes more than two, 300,000 
chemicals to find one new chemical pesticide. It costs nearly $300 million and takes almost 12 years to get a new chemical pesticide to market. And if you look at the number, the orange bars, the number of new discoveries or new leads coming out of the big chemical companies would be BSF and Syngenta, now uh, Bayer uh, owns Monsanto now. The, they're, they're discovering things, but they're not, the blue is the number of new products coming to market. So the pipeline at the EPA is very small. There's very few new active ingredient chemicals coming through because it is hard, harder and harder to find a chemical pesticide that meets all of today's requirements for health and environmental and human safety. So we see that there's a real opportunity for us, companies like ours. So indeed, if you, biologicals, which would be defined as either biocontrol or biopesticides, and I'll get more into detail about that, or biostimulants, um, are growing at between 10 and 20 percent compounded annual growth rate per year globally, while chemical pesticides flat to maybe 1 or 2 percent. Now, chemical pesticides, of course, are 60 billion, and these are only a couple billion, so we have a long way to go. But um, uh, suffice to say, there are, I'll talk about the number of drivers of why biologicals are the fastest growing input segment. So here's why. Okay, we heard about yields. Yields is not everything. You're right. But you, there, I, I'm tired of hearing that you can't get um, as high yields in organic or regenerative farming. Yes, you can, but you can also get the quality. And it's, as we know, and I heard today and yesterday, it's not just about yields, it's also about quality. But incorporating biologicals into programs, um, if you have to use biologicals, indeed can get you better yields and quality today than chemical are more science-based. They're sure. better than they were five years ago or a decade ago. So the products are getting better. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of science behind the products. And it's really important to understand the science behind the products, because there are still some snake oils out there. There's a, there, the number one barrier to use of biologicals is awareness and education. I did a survey earlier in the year um, uh, in, of California almond growers. Now, everywhere you look, everything is nuts now in California. Uh, all the, all the uh, well, that's actually. <laughs> Sorry, Freudian slip, but it is true, actually, both meanings. <laughs> Everywhere I look, there's almonds and pistachios and walnuts, which was, used to be in alfalfa or, or tomatoes. And uh, I surveyed uh, nut growers, and 82% of the almond growers had never heard of a, what a biological was, 82% in California. And, we're the, we have, and we now grow 1.3 million acres. So that awareness and education is very low. Never mind talking to a corner soybean farmer. I went to a, a farmer to farmer show last year put on by Farmers Business Network and um, I was there to do a, a, a teach-in about biologicals and not one farmer, conventional farmer, had under, had, knew what a biological was. So very low awareness. This, you might be higher up on the learning curve. So if you're exporting outside of the United States, you have to worry about chemical residues. The buyers want to go beyond the letter of the law for residues and have zero residues. So this is a big deal, especially for, um, for growers like where I am. A walnut grower exports 60% of the, the nuts and has to worry about the European and J Japanese buyers who don't want any chemicals. We can spray our products right up to harvest and not worry about residues. More and more, I will hear growers talk about resistance. And these are growers who use chemicals back to back back so they burn out their chemicals. I, that's their, their term. So I was on a citrus farm not long ago, and he says, uh, what have you got for mites? I've burned out my chemicals because uh, they're overusing uh, the chemicals. And so biologicals typically have a multi-site mode of action or a complex mode of action, whereas chemicals typically have a single site mode of action, and resistance develops very quickly to them. So we can um, uh, use biologicals to create a more durable pest management program because of their multi-site mode of action. Also, where we are, and I'm sure some places where you are, uh, we have uh, a serious problem with labor because of our immigration, our broken immigration laws. So farmers are not getting the labor they used to. In fact, strawberry, uh, a, lot of, a lot of conventional strawberries moving to Mexico, and in California, the strawberries are, are uh, transitioning to organic or for export because just getting the labor is just too expensive. But you can spray in the morning and be back in the field with a biological, whereas you have to wait longer for a chemical. I mentioned there's still controversy about uh, chemicals causing or contributing to bee decline, whereas most, but not all, but most biologicals 
are generally low risk to pollinators and other organisms. And while it does still cost us many millions of dollars to develop a product, it is a lot less time and a lot, of, lot less money than a chemical pesticide. So we can have tools faster than chemical companies can. But the big, big guys have figured this all out and said, well, I want to get into biologicals too. So there's a number of companies that have bought into this. In fact, my old company, AgriQuest, was purchased by Bayer in 2012. But what's interesting, since I started up my company, we, got, uh, we launched six EPA registered products for agriculture. So six new active ingredients. And not one big company has launched a single new active ingredient during that same time period. So uh, while there's a lot of activity in here, there's still not a lot of innovation coming from the large companies. So I still believe it's going to be smaller companies that are going to be providing the innovation in this industry. So let's define what are we talking about. Biopesticides, you'll also hear the term biocontrol. Typically biocontrol is used outside the United States. Biopesticide is used in the United States because we are regulated by the EPA's Biopesticide Pollution Prevention Division. Um, in, in, you might hear biorational, that's not used as much, but uh, you might hear it once in a while. Now biostimulants don't have a definition, believe it or not. However, in this farm bill, there is a definition of biostimulants. So hopefully there will be one legal definition of biostimulants coming forward because there's a patchwork of rules and a lot of confusion about what a biostimulant is. So a biostimulant is a natural substance or a microorganism that reduces crop stress or increases yield, but does not control or claim to control a pest or a disease. So it's not for crop protection. And it's much more lightly regulated than what we have for biopesticides. You can actually take the same microorganism, let's say it's a Bacillus subtilis, and use it for improving your crop's growth. That'll be a biostimulant and only regulated by the states. But if you claim that it controls plant disease, you must get it regulated by the EPA. Same micro, okay? So if you make pesticide claims, you must get it reg regulated. And the difference in regulations is vast. Um, the amount of, of things we have to do requires a million dollars worth of toxicology studies for a microbe, to, for a pesticide microbe. And we, can have, we have to prove that there are no human pathogens. No, oh, that's a good thing. Um, and you have to have a consistent manufacturing process and proof that five commercial batches, you can make it consistently. None of that is required for a biostimulant. So when you choose a biostimulant, it could be a, you know, a cocktail of different things. It could be seaweed extract or it could be you know, a consortium of microbes. Please understand the science behind the, the, the product and, and ask the manufacturer, have they done any toxicology testing? Because you certainly don't want human pathogens or pathogens in your, in your um, uh, consortia of microbes in, in your biostimulant. And, and number two, what is the science behind it? So for example, let's say I hear all the time, while well, we've got this great uh, bioconsortia of microbes, this biostimulant, it's got 20 microbes in it. And I said, well, how do you do your QC from batch to batch? To batch? So you ferment it in a vat, and you've got 20 microbes. Well, how, which 20 are doing the work? Well, we think five are doing the most of the work. So we use PCR to identify those mi five microbes. So every batch, our QC, we know that we have at least those five, mi five important microbes in there. I said, well, what about the rest of the microbes? What are they doing? What are they? Uh, make, are you sure there's nothing toxic in there? And if you use PCR to identify, which is a genetic way to identify your microbe, um, polymerase, polymerase chain reaction, you, you are only going to find what you want. If you're only, if you're only doing PCR on five, then you don't know what you have in there that you don't want. So if you're not doing PCR on, on human pathogens in there, you don't know if you're going to have human pathogens in there. So it's really important to educate yourself on the various many different companies with biostimulants and microbial brews and consortia. What is the science? What is their quality control behind their product? Same for bio, bionutrition. I'm not in that space, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, I don't, I, we don't have any products in there. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, Biopesticide Pollution Prevention, has two branches. One is the microbial branch, and one is the bio biochemical branch. And that's how they're regulated. So they have a branch chief for each one. And uh, as it says, micro microbial branch regulates microorganisms. And they can be dead or alive. They do not have to be alive. Um, sometimes microbes don't produce spores. 
gram-negative bacteria, so they die um, if, after a period of time because they don't have any strong resting spores like bacillus. And then you're left with what's left of the byproducts, the, the natural compounds that's causing the pesticidal activity. We have a number of products like that that are actually bacteria that are, have actually, are not living because uh, they're, they don't produce any resting spores by bacillus. Now, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. So there's a tiered process that the EPA, to pr you have to prove that it's safe. And if you're a biochemical, which would be a pheromone, a plant extract, fatty acid, or any nature identical substance that's not a microbe, you have to go through a biochemical classification committee at the EPA and prove that it has a non-toxic mode of action to the pest or the plant pathogen. Okay, so again, just because it's natural doesn't mean it gets regulated as a biopesticide, which has a more streamlined process than chemicals, you have to prove the safety. So here's what we have to do, among many other things, but this is, these are the main, what we call tier one, or the six pack, um, because we have to do six different types of toxicology studies. We have to do rat, again, these are not required for biostimulants, uh, but for biopesticides only. We have to test on rats, we have to do, unfortunately, a test on animals, but rabbit and, and eye and guinea pig sensitization. We have to show uh, the product chemistry. Now, with a microbe, um, you know, product chemistry may be number of colony forming units per gram, so it's defined differently for my, microbials. And um, a, a five batch analysis, as, as I mentioned, you have to prove that you can make it consistently and that you're measuring something, whether it's colony forming units per gram or some natural byproduct from the microbe in your, consistently made in your product. Again, no, no human pathogens. Also, we cannot have an overrun of other microbes in our microbial or our, bio, or our biochemical product. You have to, even if there's some benign microbe in there, there's a limit, and it's a fairly low limit of what EPA allows um, in our product of a microbial contaminant, even a benign one. We have to do an endangered species review to prove that there's not going to be effects to non-targets. And uh, we have to do, EPA is now requiring us to do not just an acute study on bees, but we have to do a full hive study on bees. All biologicals have to do that now. And we have to do an exemption from tolerance petition. So that means um, that we can petition to be exempt from residues and allowed to be used right up to harvest. We have to petition for that. It's not automatic. Now, there are a lot of natural products. Some are organic, but they're not registered as biopesticides. They're registered as chemicals. So this sometimes causes confusion. Abamectin, a, very, uh, very, a product used for, uh, for mite, typically, and a few other insects, is a fermentation product. It's a natural product. But because it has a toxic mode of action, it is regulated as a chemical pesticide. Spinosad, used by a lot of organic, and trust, used by a lot of organic farmers. And trust is the organic formulation. The other brands are the non-organic formulations. However, it is regulated as a chemical pesticide and not as a biopesticide. Why? Because it has a toxic mode of action. It works on the insect's nervous system, the GABA uh, system of the insect, which also humans have a similar pathway, even though this is fairly low toxic to humans. If you look at the label, it also has a bee warning, and it says it affects bees. So this is used very liberally by organic farmers, I know, but they should be very careful not to be using it when bees are around. Um, same with pyganic, which is an extract of, of pyrethrum flowers, allowed in organic, but is a, has a toxic mode of action because it works on the sodium channel of the pest, which is enough similar to, to, to humans, and it also is toxic to fish and non-target beneficials, although it's, got very, it's very biodegradable, which is why it's good for, used a lot by organic farmers because it's gone quickly, but it does have a toxic mode of action. And then a very good fungicide but that's been around for a while and is very heavily used, the strobilurns, or oxystrobin, was originally discovered from a, an, a, from a mushroom, but because they modified it from its natural form, it then automatically is classified as a chemical pesticide. Same for the one called Mimic or Confirm. That is mode of action is it affects the molting or the, um, the natural molting inhibition of the, uh, it is a natural molting inhibitor of, uh, of insects, but because it was chemically modified, then it's not a biopesticide.
And I'm happy to take questions if anybody wants to yell out. Yeah. It depends on how the virus is used. So you want to use a virus against another virus? Then it would be considered a biopesticide. If you engineer a coat protein for a virus um, to make a genetically engineered plant, that's a GMO, not, a, not, one of the, not considered a biopesticide. That's a totally different regulatory. I mean, it's under the, the in, it's regulated in the biopesticide division, GMOs are, but they have a totally different regulatory process than um, the natural biologics. We can't engineer gene edit, do anything to change or purify a compound from our microbes and sell it as a, pure, pure, a purified compound like spinosad or avermectin, and that it becomes a chemical pesticide and it's regulated differently. Yeah. So why, why bio, why natural? Well, you know, more than 50% of your pharmaceuticals, your drugs, have come from natural sources. Only about 15% of, of the biopesticides sold today. Why is that? Well, because we've had a long history of successful synthetic chemistry uh, era and then right into the GMO era. And so the agriculture sort of skipped the natural product era that the drug companies went through, which would be going to the rainforest and looking for new plants and, and microbes. So there's m many examples. Digitalis is a heart drug. Taxol comes from the Pacific U for breast cancer and your antibiotics and so forth uh, from in the pharmaceutical world but just such a small number really coming de or derived um, in the agriculture world. There is a, a microbe or a plant that can do just about anything. I believe that you could find a microbe to do, to do any task you want to do. And so there's uh, a whole world out there still to discover. Where do we look? So I am on my vacation. I'm not doing any discovery right now because we're, we're focused on our commercial products. But in the past, for this company, I, I, we tested found, isolated, and tested 18,000 microbes. And then my previous company, AgriQuest, 22,000. Previous company before that, Entotech, we did 55,000. So um, over time, you see patterns in nature where you find microbes that are going to provide some bioactivity. You, I can send you out and randomly, and you, you might find something. But over time, we do see those patterns in nature. A dry creek bed, for example, that one that's wet and dry and wet and dry at different times, the microbes there are really hardy because they have, if they're going to survive, they have to survive the different cycles of wetting and drying. And, and uh, certainly, an organic, I've isolated, our groups have isolated many microbes from organic farms and compared, compared them to conventional farms. The biodiversity, until this latest healthy soil initiative, a typical con conventional farmer would have a very low biodiversity on their farm, but organic farms, um, much higher biodiversity. So the species, the number of species of microbes. And yes, the rainforest is one of the very best places to look for areas of high biodiversity. But you can, you can find them anywhere. So what we have done um, is bring the sample back to the lab. It could be soil or uh, dead bugs or compost or leaves or flowers. And the uh, my, the microbiologists will isolate them on a plate and look for something interesting. Well, how do they know something's interesting? Well, sometimes you'll be, see big zones of inhibition, warding, one microbe warding off another. Um, that's how we discovered Serenade at my previous company. It was from an organic peach orchard in Fresno County. Um, but but um, a lot of times, um, the, mi the microbiologists just have to get under the microscope and, and look at what's going on. and distinguish over time some of the more ordinary species and, and strains to something different. And then we pluck one microbe from each, one microbe per, uh, goes onto a, a plate. So you might have a whole bunch of hundreds of them um, or thousands of different species on one primary plate. And then they pick the ones they want and put one per plate. And then we grow it in a little mini fermenter um, and, uh, and then test against the pests. In our collection, we now have about 39% Actinomycetes. We've never commercialized from an actinomycete. And they're really good at producing pesticidal compounds. And I'm not sure why, but I guess it was for us, the first ones were bacteria. And then we have one in development from a fungus. So then we test against, in miniature assays in the laboratory, looking for pesticidal activity. We also look at plant health activity. We also have done some looking at drought stress. And also, can we improve the uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus? So we've done a, a number of different types of assays over time. 
Um, and, and we kind of rotate the, the bioassays depending on what we want to discover. Now, um, micro, just like penicillin comes from a mole, your antibiotics come from microorganisms. And, and as I said, uh, Taxol comes from the Pacific U. We want to know what the microbe or the plant is making that's causing the pesticidal activity. Not many people do this. Most companies um, just have, a, have a, uh, a microbe that they don't know what the microbe's making. And um, so we've, we've gone to the next level and said, well, we really actually want to know the, the natural chemistry because then every batch we make can have a specific level of the good compounds and we want to make sure there's nothing toxic in there um, and we would not develop anything if we found, and we often find microbes uh, that might be very, very good pesticidal microbes that have toxic compounds. So we want to weed those out. Then we want to put them in a formulation that um, farmers can use. Now for organic formulations, we have a very small list of inner ingredients that we can use, ever shrinking list under the National Organic Program. And so there's been an, a number of, of inert ingredients that have been grandfathered in from the original rules. And it is still controversial. Um, and, but, but sometimes you just need some preservatives and things in there so your, your jug doesn't explode and, and, and so forth. And you need some functionality that you can't get with just the, the, the plant extract or the microbe alone. Um, and I can tell you, plant extracts are a bear. Uh, you've got to put something in them to make them um, uh, uh, handle properly for a spray rig. We then have a, a, a plant, we have a, a pilot plant in Davis, California, and a, a plant, in, a fermentation manufacturing plant of three 20,000 liter tanks where we make our products in uh, Bangor, Michigan, Southwest Michigan. We, we always do field trials um, before we launch a product so we know what, what, what at least what some, some of the activity will be. And then, of course, we have to develop the doss dossier for regulatory submission to both the EPA. And then the states all require a separate submission, which is usually a rubber stamp, except California, which has its own system that takes usually 12 to 18 months beyond the EPA. So uh, we're, trying to sh we're trying to shorten that time frame. So I make a point about um, the business models of a big agrochemical company and a company like ours, because this causes a lot of confusion um, in, in the, in, in, in with farmers. And I've been accused of saying, being told I bring a product to market too quickly. Well, I don't actually, because farmers want to try new tools. But because it's a different business model that, that conventional farmers are used to. So they're used to a, a chemical company coming with them to them with a product that has $300 million up front spent, huge amounts of money, 12 years of research behind it, and thousands and thousands of field trials. So they know everything about the product, OK? Well, I don't have that kind of money. So I, I spend about 3 to $5 million to develop a product for the US market. And it takes me about 3 to 5 years, OK? So when I come to market, I may have 150 field trials behind the product. It's good. It's good. I have some. I, I know what. I know generally what the product does, but I don't know everything about it. And it's version 1.0. It's a good formulation, but it may not be the best formulation that I'll ever make. So I've put out version 1.0 with farmers who want to try the product. And there's always farmers who want to try something new, and because they also have a lot of problems that are still unsolved by chemicals. So I have a lot, a lot of farmers who love our business model, but I've gotten a lot, taken a lot of criticism of this model in the industry because um, someone, you know, someone will say, well, you're putting it out too soon. I'm actually not putting it out too soon because I'll put it out instead of this huge, massive, risky launch on you know, millions of acres, I'll put it out there on a few hundred, few hundred acres or less than 1,000 acres with a few early adopter growers, and they give me wonderful feedback about what the product is doing, and that feeds back into our product development R&D group um, uh, for the next version. So there's an, I'll just review some of the types of uh, products that are out there and what they're based on. So um, these are um, insecticides and acaricides. And if you want these, I, I, I didn't print out all of this information, but I'm happy to send you the, the, these if you need it. Um, and so we have the B, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, still very good for caterpillars. And then my company has two new species of bacteria. One is from a Chromobacterium subsugi, which was found under hemlock. So 
subfugi means under hemlock, found under hemlock by the US Department of Agriculture, and we developed it. And we have a second um, insecticide from a new species, which we found from a garden by a Buddhist temple <laughs> in Japan. And it is, it is a new species of Burkholderia called Burkholderia rhinogensis. And they're both, the both of the bacteria are dead because we haven't found a way to keep the bacteria alive, but we don't need to keep the bacteria alive because the, the microbes are producing in their cells insecticidal, miticidal compounds that cause the pesticidal activity. So we find ways to um, put it, our product in, in the jug or the bag is the, is the dead bacteria plus the, the pesticidal compounds. Whereas something like a BT will have spores in it, so it'll have living, living spores. There's also a number, I don't list all of them, but old stalwarts like Metarhizium, Bovaria, um, there's many companies making um, uh, products from Metarhizium and Bovaria. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. So, very interesting question on stink bug control because um, we just did a study with Cornell and we did and with Venerate, and Venerate did not kill the stink bug, but it completely stopped 100% of the damage. So I'm going to talk about a case study of the mode of action of, of Grain Devo as an example of why you have to look at the mode of action of the product instead of just dead bugs. Um, because there's th these are these have very different modes of action than chemicals that people are used to, and you don't you don't walk out and see in 48 hours the dead bug. You'll see you have to look at yield and damage. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to explain that. Yeah. So on the plant extract insecticide side, there's neem products. There's a, a, an exhibitor here called Terramera, who has a new formulation of neem. Now neem's been around as a direct and the active ingredient neem's been around forever, but Terra Mera, um, and one of those startups, has found a new formulation that makes neem better, more biologically available. So they're launching a product called Rango, Rango, yeah, which I, I will add to this. And then there's extracts of plant extracts like gyalric and soybean and, and uh, uh, capsicum. There's citrus oil products, crop oils, all have a place, good place in knocking down. So if someone, if your pest population gets away from you, the oils are good to get knocked, knock them down, and then come in with you know, products like ours where there's slower kill, which I'll explain. Um, there's a new product just reg registered from spider venom peptides. Yeah, so <laughs> some scientists in Australia have found that you can, that the, the spider venoms, there's spider venom peptides that are toxic to humans, and there's ones that are not. So they've taken the ones that are not, and they've engineered into another bacteria, E. coli, and then created a product. So because it's engineered, it is not allowed to be an organic. But, that's a, but it's still considered a biological pesticide, so it's, it's, it's dead. So there's no, there's no um, the E. coli is killed, so it's considered a bio, like a biochemical. Yeah. And there's a new one that's coming that is a butterfly pea extract that's supposed to be very broad spectrum. So quite a number of new things, in fact, there's 20, 30 new active ingredients registered even 40, I think, maybe. So there's a lot of innovation in the biological area. Now, on the, on, the, on, the, on the fungicide side, many of the things that are used as inputs are also things you'll have in your soil. Microbes, trichodermas, gliocladium, pseudomonas, streptomyces, bacillus. So these are products that are to supplement or help and give you a, if you've got a, a, a you want to prevent, you, you have a field that you haven't been able to get a disease control of or whatever and you want to add it, um, um, then, then these are a, a number of, of products coming. And, um, or they've, they've been on a, they've out, been out actually quite a while. Um, and uh, the newest one is um, Howler from a, a startup company in North Carolina called AgBiome and that's from a, a, a strain of, a, a, a species of, of Pseudomonas. Now, I, did, I, I didn't, I underestimated way how many I should bring, but it is on our website. Um, I, there's so many bacillus biofungicides on the market. It's a very crowded area. Every single bacillus that's on the market is different from each other. Every, because we're talking about strains. So if you have a bacillus amyloliquefaciens, you have to look at what strain it is. 
to know what it actually is because every bacillus amyloliquefaciens or every bacillus subtilis are not the same as each other. And I did put a, some of you got the cheat sheet, but you can, uh, you can um, email me or find it on our website uh, because it's very confusing all of the different products that are out there, but they're all different and they're all fermented differently. So I could ferment a bacteria five different ways and have a different product every time. So how it's fermented is really important. So for example, my old company's product, um, Serenade, we fermented it and then captured the whole cell broth, which would include the spores of the bacteria bacillus plus all the antifungal lipopeptides. Certus has a product that produces very similar lipopeptides, but they wash away all the lipopeptides and it's just a pure spore prep. So while the bacteria may be similar, they're very different products. So you really have to look a little deeper at each product and to know what it, what it is doing, what strain it is, and how it's produced. So here's a good example of that. So we have naturopathic chemists in our lab who take the whole cell broth, the soup of the bacteria, and put it through an HPLC, a machine that can detect, tell, um, show the compounds after they've been exposed to UV light, they come out in a spectrum like this. So the first one is Stargus. It's a Bacillus amyloliquefaciens strain F727, which we discovered from an organic rice field in Northern California. That's our, that we uh, are targeting for downy mildew and white molds and botrytis. Now product, I can't, I'm, I can't tell you exactly what they are, but product, I can, but I'm not supposed to. So product A and product B are two different um, but similar products. But look at the lipopeptides, okay? So if you're, if you're just wanting to grab a biofungicide, you, you, you think you're getting the same thing. But the lipopeptide profiles are very, very different. So it's really important, again, to understand that. Um, and some companies don't, don't ever know the, lipo, the, the chemistry or the lipopeptides behind their bacillus, but it would be good to ask and see if they do know. Moving on to non-microbial biofungicides, there's our product Regalia, which is an extract of giant knotweed. It's a biofungicide, but also has increased crop growth and certain quality aspects on every crop we've looked at. A, most, a very new one is um, from Stockton, or STK, is Timorex Gold, which is a plant extract from tea tree oil, neem oil, it's fungicidal, and then other oils and potassium bicarbonate. Nematicides, um, this is a very, active area because so many chemical nematicides have been removed from the market, although there's still some on the market that folks would, would, would like to, the regulatory agencies would like to get rid of, as well as the food, food buy, channel buyers would like to get rid of and, and transition to other things. So there's a number of new ones on the market, including uh, ours, which is Magistine, which is that uh, same bacteria in, um, in Venerate, but this one is our product is, de is deployed as a nematicide. So some of these, in fact, most of these um, are actually living microbes that infect and kill the nematode. And, some, and they're, they're very good, actually. Um, with the exception of uh, Diterra and Magistine, which are based on the natural chemistry produced by the bacteria or the fungus in case of, in case of Diterra, all the rest are living bacteria that um, either kill the nematode or increase the crop growth through indirect means, like Votivo. Doesn't really have much direct kill on a nematode, but it uh, is used as successfully as a seed treatment, but it really is more about increasing crop growth than actually killing the nematode. So here's my case study. So this is Chromobacterium subsugi, found by USDA under, um, in, under Hemlock in a Maryland uh, location near the, near the ARS uh, facility, and we commercialized it. It has very complex mode of action. We're finding these weird compounds like this, we called it chromamid, which is a completely new, new, new compound, new to nature. And we found six proteins also produced by the, the bacteria, and we found, it's, it's a purple bacteria, and this is the compound, or violacin, it's called violacin, which causes, uh, the, which pr is the purple pigment. And they all do different things. So we found out that the, uh, the violacin stops the insects from feeding within less than a minute. 
how do we know that? We actually hooked up electrodes to the insects. We did psyllids. Um, we did potato psyllid and, and Asian citrus psyllid and hooked them up and found that, indeed, we could measure that they stopped feeding in less than a minute. However, they don't die for seven to 10 days. So my neighbor has completely taken out all their lawn and put in a whole regenerative um, uh, fruit and, and vegetables in their, in their yard. And um, they had a breakout of, uh, uh, in their squash and cucumbers of uh, some aphids. And I said, oh, OK, I'll, 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 uh, I'll spray some Grain Devo on there. And even them, they couldn't tolerate that they saw the aphids on there for seven days. So I said, just wait, please wait. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't. But they ended up pulling out all of, the, all of the squash and cucumbers and not getting any yield. I said, you could have waited. <laughs> But uh, this is a good example, with far, same, you know, same with most of the farmers. So we have to do some education of the modes of action of these new things. The chromamid, that big monster compound, is, is implicated in gut disruption. So they do get enough, even though they stop feeding, they still get enough. So then they start throwing up and, um, and also get diarrhea. Also, these compounds stop them from reproducing. So we have growers notice that over time that they'll have lower populations, but um, they have to make sure that they use it properly in order to see the effect because it's not a knockdown. There's no knockdown effect. So here's an example of um, water, comparing the effect of this bacteria, water, two different, formula two different formulations, oh, no, the, the, sorry, the technical whole cell broth and then the formulation and the and abamectin um, natural product, but a chemical registered as a chemical and what it does to aphids. So we had to develop a completely new bioassay to, uh, we had an entomologist who said this product didn't work, an and, uh, entomologist in our lab, and I said, no, you have to find another way to test it. So we came up with a repellency assay to, to show that you could repel or reduce uh, the, the progeny um, with this product. Now this is a spotted wing Drosophila, and this was done in uh, Belgium showing that um, we, actually, we actually didn't kill the adults in this study, no, no adult fly kill. But we very well, the, the red and the blue line, are the um, number of eggs laid. So uh, this is a, a great product for reducing the adults from laying eggs, but it wasn't going to um, kill the adults right away. Stink bug, you mentioned stink bug, OK. Grandivo is not known to be a good stink bug product because it doesn't have any adult activity. Um, really, it doesn't have strong adult activity. But what this shows was USDA work showing that um, the, it freaked out the stink bug. So they, they went, this is the distance moved from a half an hour to four and a half hours. All the other things we tested, venerate, the water, um, the, the, bu the bugs didn't move around. But in this case, they went crazy. They moved all up trying to get rid of it because it's very distasteful to them. Now, did it kill them? Eventually, this was on a glass exposure on a glass slide. Eventually, but uh, you know, it took it took seven days um, in captivity to finally to finally kill them. So we don't have a lot of people using Grandivo for um, for stink bug because of this. But uh, we so we switched over to Venerate, our other bacteria, and then that's when we found that it was stronger on adults. But it still took a long time to kill adults. But it did completely when compared to the chemicals had. 100% um, of reduction in d damage on, uh, and they were, they were using apples in that case. So it requires treating early when you have adults out there, but not a huge population. And so that's a, a change of behavior because all of your IPM is based on, is developed on thresholds. So wait until it gets to a threshold population, then you treat. Well, with some of these new things, that's, that's not going to work. So it requires a little bit of, of different thinking. Now, a really cool study is going on at UC Davis uh, with a PhD, Emily Bick, who uh, was a Cornell intern. And she was an intern for me at, when she was at Cornell. Now she's at Davis with Driscoll's and the Strawberry Commission. And what they're doing is they noticed that um, uh, ligus bugs love alfalfa. But lagus bugs also love strawberries and is the number one pest of strawberries. And so they understood that this uh, Grain Devo was very, this purple pigment in Grain Devo from the bacteria was repelling insects and stopping their feeding. 
So they've done now the second year of trials where they sprayed the strawberries uh, with Brain Devo and put a, a strip of alfalfa nearby. And so they forced the, they actually, the, the bugs love alfalfa, so they forced them out of the, um, of the strawberries and into the alfalfa and used the alfalfa as a trap crop. And then they were able to destroy them in the, in the strips of alfalfa nearby. It hasn't been published yet, but I'm really excited by that um, way that they're exploiting the repellency of, that, of, a, of a new, this new bacteria. Now, um, another thing I'll mention is that uh, folks like to put in um, adjuvants to, to a lot of things and mix and match adjuvants. And what we're finding is that you can wreck a, a biological with an adjuvant pretty easily. So this is the LC50 or the number, or the concentration um, to kill 50% of the insects. And here's some um, adjuvants that you add to make the product spread better on the crop. And it, uh, it really uh, reduces the activity of, the, of it dramatically. So it's really important to understand from the manufacturer uh, what you're adding to the tank and other things you're adding to the tank, because they can really wreck some of these biologicals. Another um, issue is that a lot of farmers think more water is better. So they'll be dousing the, the, the crop to runoff and using you know, uh, 200 gallons per acre or 150, 200 or on acre uh, water per and up. And what we found is that most, of, most biologicals, because of their unique mode of action, like Bt, for example, or Grandivo or Venerate, the insects has to have enough lethal dose on that leaf to get enough to consume to be active. And if you're watering too much and it's all dr dropping off, literally dropping off, then you're watering it all down onto the ground. So we did this study of looking at a 50 gallons per acre, 100 gallons per acre, and 150 gallons per acre compared to the chemical treatment and found dramatically different um, marketable fruit with 50 versus 100 or 150. So most of the time, we find that uh, um, these products are probably not being used with the right amount of water. Too much. Now, this is a pure example which you don't really want to do, which is pure input substitution. Okay, But over and over and over again, um, we kept hearing from the land grant professors um, around the country where, where Asian citrus psyllid on citrus was popping out you'll never be able to control Asian citrus silt organically. So uh, one of the professors at University of Florida said, well, yeah, we'll, we'll try it. So they did. And, and this, uh, I wouldn't recommend it, because look at how many sprays. But what they've done in, in Florida is the Florida citrus industry is in, in, is in dire straits. And they've nuked Asian citrus psyllid, which, which transmits HLB, citrus greening for years where they do back-to-back -back sprays with chemicals. Well, predictably, the, the psyllid became resistant to the key chemicals, okay? So we, I, I, w I went down there with my team to a, one of the largest citrus growers, and they're, they want to just find a, much, a better way, a more holistic way, and they really have to, because they're not going to do it in the, the way they've been doing it. So they're reducing their number of sprays, and they said, okay, they took me out in the field and they found whole swaths of um, trees where they were doing better than another area. Well, why? Well, they had paid more attention to their soil health, the nutrition of the, of the plant, and they were different crop varieties. So it dawned on them that you know, there could be a much more holistic system that they could develop, and the trees could survive uh, better and still yield appropriately um, if, if they adopt, completely uh, tried and, and turned it around, it, the system on its head. But just I show you this just to show that you can develop an input substitution strategy on any crop. In fact, Cornell um, uh, Carrot Cox, the plant pathologist, has now got an all organic program for, uh, for fire blight, which no one ever thought you could do. But I, as we know from this conference, that's really not what you want to do. Um, and I'll talk more in a minute about why, why uh, we need to change how the land grant institutions um, do their research to change this. Yeah? What is the shelf life of products like Grandivo and Trust Organic? Th there'll be three plus years. They're very long shelf life, yeah. Not all biologicals are. There's some, some living that, that are six months to a year, but there are others that are longer, yeah. So again, biopesticides have gotten better, better over time. 
uh, weed it, weeding out a lot of the snake oils. That same, that same process that happened in the biopesticides is now happening on the biostimulant side, side where there's, there's more science coming in and snake oils are being weeded out. There, a, lot, a lot of grower receptivity but unsure how to use them and definitely more education and training needed. And what we do a lot of times is demonstrations on the farm, a block of what the traditional practice is with a, 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 a biological program comparing. But what I hear over and over and over again from the farmers that we talk to just constantly is that, what is the land grant uh, professors doing? They do re, uh, what do you call single factor research, or I call it the reductionist research, where you do one product tested against something else, usually a cocktail of chemicals, okay? There's no, there's a lot of money in the USDA for research, but it's, is it, is it developing, is it going towards developing a more holistic, holistic system that incorporates all of the tools, crop varieties, cultural practices, soil health, um, and, and then when, if needed, biologicals? No, we could, I haven't been able to find, it's always about finding a silver bullet, isn't it? The next silver bullet. So one of the things I'm going to do before I retire, <laughs> if, if, if I've got many things I've got to do, but, but uh, uh, one of the things I want to do is, is to get more uh, public funding um, into development of more on-farm holistic programs that incorporate an entire, like we've been talking about the last three days, um, instead of an input substitution strategy or a silver bullet strategy. You know, in California, uh, we have strawberries that were dependent on methyl bromide and other fumigants. So what have they done? They've just switched from methyl bromide to uh, other chemical fumigants that are s still toxic, but they don't disrupt the ozone layer. So that's not, that's not sustainable in the long term. So we have to do it a different way. Back to the practical part of it. Um, the label has a lot of information about, about how you use something successfully and whether they have impacts on pollinators and what adjuvants to use and so forth. So it's always important to read a label. I live, uh, uh, I, I live next to a 150 acre farm and it was an alfalfa wheat tomato rotation for many years and then it was purchased by a, new, a, a different farmer and he put in almonds and um, he, he, he sprayed a cocktail of three herbicides on New Year's Eve at last year and um, it drifted in the fog and landed over all of our houses nearby. Yeah, and uh, we had symptoms. And so, um, if you read the if you read the label, it was off label use because uh, it said do not use when there's a weather inversion, do not use when there's fog, do not use near a housing development. All of the things that were wrong. But it's just still shocking to me that in this day and age, I still we still have that kind of practices. Um, right next to housing developments, but that's why we have laws, right? Laws and regs. Look at if the microbials have restrictions on uh, what they can be tank mixed with, because so many things are mixed into the tank, whether it's other products or adjuvants, and there's some that don't take tank mixes very well and others that do, so it's important to read the label again. Now, this one, <laughs> herbicides. I really like the talks I heard about how you can control uh, weeds without using any herbicides. But the number one request I get from most organic, from organic farmers is, do you have a herbicide? Well, the herbicides that are out there are burn downs, they're expensive, um, and they're high volume, and they, you have to reapply them very quickly. So there's not a whole lot out there. Suppress has got quite a good following. It's probably the best of the, of the lot, uh, which is made from caprylic and cap capric acids. Um, but we need, we need something better if you're going to use a herbicide. So we actually, this bacteria, remember how I said if you can ferment something different ways, it'll, it'll ferment, it'll be a different product? Well, sure enough, this Burkholderia rhinogensis, which we found from the Buddhist temple garden in Japan, we can ferment it differently and we can have it be a herbicide, a nematicide, or an insecticide, depending how we ferment it. And so uh, we, look, we look at it, giving it different food in the fermenter and it makes herbicidal compounds or not. In this case, we made, it, made, made this bacteria make herbicidal compounds. It's a very interesting bacteria. And um, we, we have submitted this to the EPA, so it's waiting approval. Um, and, and the compound that we made in fermentation is systemic in the plant. That is very unusual and we think a very exciting discovery. So it kills 
Palmer amaranth that is resistant to glyphosate. And um, it was just killing a few little, you know, couple inches high. But as we have continued to develop it, we're now killing Palmer that's resistant to glyphosate that's uh, probably this big and eight nodes. So we're very excited by this. Um, huh? What was the name of that? Well, we haven't named it yet. <laughs> it's still waiting approval. It's, it's called MBI014, so it's in development. And, uh, but it's, it's slow kill, systemic kill. Um, we know the mode of action. Um, it's completely new mode of action, so it works very differently from anything that's out there. Um, and, uh, but but very, very interesting. And so it's, it's not a Roundup because it's not as broad spectrum. It has no effect on the soil microbiome. Um, and uh, it's very, and the problem, it's taken us a long time to get th this to the EPA because the compound that's herbicidal is so biodegradable, unlike chemical herbicides, that, I mean, it's literally degrades it in, in, in hours. So we have to find, a, how to find a, a formulation where we could stabilize it enough to get into the weed and do its thing. So that was not easy. And also use organically listed inerts at the same time. Yeah. Well, it's broad spectrum, but not as broad spectrum. Yeah, it's still fairly broad spectrum. But I don't think it's good. It, it only gets uh, grasses at high doses. Over time, as we improve the fermentation and the product, I'm sure we'll get grasses. Because I know I can put a lot of like a 10x whole cell broth from the bacteria on grasses and kill grasses. But that's not going to be economical. You know, we don't want to be in the hundreds of dollars per acre. We want to be a bit in, the, in the 10 $20 per acre, which we could do on broad leaves um, right now. Yeah. So the, just to compare, the compound that we discovered that we make from this bacteria, which is so biodegradable that we can barely keep it <laughs> around, but it is compared to, it's on the weed, on the pigweed. It is active. Per, uh, uh, grams per acre of active ingredients, active at 0.2 grams. Look at glyphosate, it's active at 100. And um, another uh, very important herbicide is uh, glufosinate, uh, 348. And then suppress, which is the, the best burn down uh, for organic, is, is at 4,000 4, something. So we have a very, very exciting discovery. And, um, uh, but it's taken us many years to get it there because I said because of that, sh that, that I had three <laughs> research directors that gave up on it except my, my current one, because uh, we couldn't stabilize that uh, potent herbicidal compound. Now we're working on all the ways to get it, how you would use it, um, and uh, timing and, and uh, applications. And we find out that actually it is so degraded in UV light that it's better to be used uh, like at 5 o'clock instead of 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, as, as time goes on, um, remember that incremental way we improve our products, version 1.0, 2.0. We'll have many versions of this product, I'm sure, over time. Now switching to another one that's very interesting. This is a new, new fungus from Gary's, discovered by Gary Strobel, who's a professor of plant pathology at Montana State University. And it's actually a new genus and species, Muscador albus. And he found it from under the bark of cinnamon, cinnamon tree in Honduras rainforest. He was on an expedition looking for uh, microbes. And uh, he was doing, he's actually working for, looking for pharmaceutical um, microbes. And he put the back, he found this, this, put a piece of cinnamon bark onto a Petri plate. This fluffy white fungus grew out. And when he got back to the US, he put it, had, had it in a box with all the rest of his plates. Everything else in the box was dead, except this fluffy white fungus. Well, in order for that to happen, it must have been producing something volatile gases. So indeed, we have characterized that there are a cocktail of gases that are very benign compounds, but it are, make a potent combination when together. So if you smell a peach, and it smells this really nice smell, ripe peach, well, a number of those compounds um, are the same ones that are in, produced by this fungus, and it's a really good fumigant. So we can put it in the soil, and it will um, control, well, we're finding that it increases yield. It doesn't necessarily kill the pathogen or the nematodes, but it certainly increases yield. And because you want to make sure it's not affecting the soil microbiome, our molecular biology group did a study where uh, looked at pre and post application of this to the soil, and it didn't change the existing soil microbiome. So we're very excited by that. And it's great to have the molecular tools now to be able to know that our products are uh, not, not affecting um, the natural microbes that are out there. So let's talk about soil health. We heard a lot of, lot of talks about soil health. It is the fundamental you know, basis for, for wh what you're doing with your crop. But 
what, what we're finding, and I was, and I was glad, glad to hear Leilani agree, say this because I do agree with her, that soil health is local. You, you, you can't, there's no one recipe for every farm in the universe, although there's a lot of companies thinking there might be one recipe. <laughs> it's not because every soil is different. Every time you change your, your practice, you change the, 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 whether you irrigate or not. And, and you can actually follow, and, and scientists have followed the microbiome on a, in a soil you're going from irrigated uh, to transitioning to in between um, and, and, and everything in between and finding different microbial populations. So, uh, but genomics is helping farmers unravelize, unravel the mysteries of the microbes. So um, I know a lot of farmers who are hiring companies to find out if they've got pathogens on their farm or, if, or just what is, like they might have a really bad spot where they always have verticillium or fusarium and other place where they don't. Well, what's the difference in the soil microbiome? It probably is the soil microbiome causing the difference. A couple minutes? OK. So, um, so that's, that's really helping them a lot. Um, and, uh, but there's no scientific proof that adding a consortia of microbes is going to change your microbiome that's already there. It tends to, when you apply, it might help the, the crop growth, yes, and you get higher yields, a quality, and a boost. But it, the, the soil tends to go back to what it was before. There's a company called Trace Genomics that uh, you can hire to, to characterize your soil and microbiome. There's, um, we heard a lot about micro, mycorrhizae. They're now found out that there's compounds called strigolactones that attract the mycorrhizae to the root. So there are companies now that are making versions of these strigolactones to try to apply to your root. And also, you can optimize a healthier plant, and you can do things to your crop to make them make more of these strigolactones. So keep an eye on that area of research. Very, very cool. And um, Linda Tomaschow from, uh, uh, from up there in, in, uh, in Washington State did a study and found that after wheat, 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 so successive monoculture of wheat over many years, take all disease disappeared over time. And she found out that it was due to some microbes in the soil from the Pseudomonas group. And there was a, a particular compound chemistry produced and excreted by this bacteria that was causing the suppressive soil and reducing the take all over time. So it, there's a lot of exciting research going on in this area. But I would say we're still at the very early stages and no real rules yet um, so far. I will skip that since we're, um, uh, we, there's companies that are using artificial intelligence to grade crops to uh, do diagnostics. So be able to just use an iPhone now to be able to diagnose your crop and uh, grade strawberries and so forth. So keep an eye on some of that AI stuff going on. But suffice to say that, as I mentioned before, we're still too in a single factor research phase um, that most of the public funding is looking at one thing in a system instead of developing a holistic system. We need, you heard the, uh, Joel say yesterday we need a Manhattan Project for, for compost. We need a new Manhattan Project for IPM. There's no question. And so I will end there. And there's a Bioproducts bio Industry Alliance, which is I started in 2000 for all the companies that are in this industry. And uh, there's also ATRA, Association for Responsible Technology, AATRA.org, that also has a lot of information about uh, th this topic on their website as well. All right. And we're out of time. <laughs>